was all about. Big, powerful, fast, smooth cars. Welcome to the episode of Jay Lawn's Garage, the car we're featuring today, my 1931 Bentley 8 liter Mulliner sedan. This was called Bentley's greatest achievement by a lot of people. He wanted to build a 100 mile an hour car that could carry four people comfortably, well, even more than four people, actually, uh, to sort of tour the continent. And uh, they built a 100 of these, and they were all guaranteed to go over 100 miles an hour. Uh, the ones with lighter coach work obviously went faster. Uh, I think 125 was the highest the lighter coachwork cars went. This, this one, I can testify, has been over 100 miles an hour using my GPS. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing automobile. It's a six-cylinder, eight-liter, uh, overhead cam, four valves per cylinder. W. O. Bentley was a fascinating guy. You know, there's certain engineers, and then there were engineers' engineers. W. O. Bentley, Fred Noggy Duesenberg, Frederick Lanchester, Mark Burkett, uh, Carl Benz. Gottlieb, uh, you know, all Daimler, all those, just a whole group of guys. Uh, pretty amazing characters. Uh, Bentley was born in 1888 and he died in 1971, so he lived a full life. He lived long enough to see his cars win Le Mans five times, and then they kind of fell into bankruptcy and he had to work for other companies. But then near the end of his life, he got to see the club was formed, the Bentley Drivers Club, and of course, uh, Bentley's became revered marks and he was, you know, just welcomed anywhere he went at a Concours or whatever. So it was nice to see. Had no children, married three times, but he had no kids. He is one of nine. He was the youngest of nine kids born in 1888 to fairly wealthy parents. Uh, he was always an engineer, even as a young man. He, he apprenticed with the Great Northern Railroad in England. Let me show you what I'm talking about. He was a locomotive engineer first and you can see the sort of locomotive like qualities in this engine here although this is an enormous engine it is only six cylinders there's no head gasket because there's no head it's all one solid piece this is how you get around blowing head gaskets these are your carburetors or carburetors as they call it this is an auto vac it, it's basically a fuel pump what it does is, if you were not running this car for a long time, you would open this up here, you'd fill this with gasoline, uh, and as the car ran, fresh gas would be pumped into this, and then it would drain, I open this here, and then it gravity feeds down into the motor. Um, interesting thing. Uh, nice to keep it all original. You have a battery and coil and a magneto, because you have spark plugs, as I said before, on each side. This is your water pump right here. Notice the honeycomb type radiator. Uh, this is the greaser. I just tightened that to shoot a shot of grease into the water pump. Uh, aluminum fan. Everything here as, as, as it was in 1931. It's hard to improve on perfection. And you have your engine light here. This lights up the engine compartment. Like I've often said with these kind of engines, they're difficult to work on because you have to go through the bottom to get to anything. To get to the valves, you've got to go th pull the engine, go through the bottom. As I've said before, it's a bit like going to the proctologist for dental work. You know, it's a little tricky. The actual engine ends here. Uh, you can see uh, Bentley's locomotive background in the designer's engine because the overhead cam is not driven by a chain or even gears, but by conrods. By imagine the wheels of a locomotive. You know how they they go like this. Well. That's what you have here. At the end of the crankshaft, you have sort of, quote, for lack of a better word, another crankshaft that turns the uh, camshaft. And you adjust it by putting washers in between it. And the squish of the oil kind of tells you how much you have, how to adjust it. And that's sort of how you adjust the valves on this thing. It's, it's a fascinating piece of engineering. These were bulletproof engines at the time. Uh, it's cast iron. The crankcase is made of uh, electron, which is a kind of a magnesium aluminum alloy. Uh, Bentley pioneered aluminum pistons and aircraft. In World War I, he designed aircraft engines, and he was sort of the father of the aluminum pistons for lightweight and uh, uh, better compression and uh, all that type of thing. And uh, just a fascinating guy, quiet guy, kept to himself. 
couldn't be more British, you know, not a real show-off kind of guy. Uh, he built his first car in 1919. In fact, the man who bought his very first car, I had his son on The Tonight Show. Uh, his name was uh, Llewellyn, I can't remember his first name. He played Q in the Bond movies. Remember the James Bond where he says to Sean Connery, I never joke Bond, I'm always very serious. Well, I, when I found out he had bought the first Bentley, I invited him on The Tonight Show to talk about it. And, we, and it was fascinating. So he bought the very first one, the three liter. He built the three liter, four and a half liter, the six liter Speed Six, and of course, his great achievement, the eight liter. You always hear about the blower Bentleys, the ones with the big blower on the front. Those were never built by Bentley. Bentley did not like supercharging. He did not like turbocharging. He just thought going to a larger engine was the best and most reliable way to gain more power. And at the time, he was proven correct because he won them all six times. A man named Tim Burkett, um, he was a, a racer, sort of a daring, daring sort of character, uh, used to race Bentleys. And with the help of, I think her name was Dorothy Padgett, a very wealthy woman, he got the money to build um, 50, or is it 55, of uh, the blower cars so they could run it at Le Mans. But again, the engines were too high stress with the blower, and none of them, none of them won the race, proving Bentley was right. He just went with a bigger motor to the six liter, and this finally, the eight liter. You know, you can see these cars were built when uh, labor was cheap and technology was expensive, because there must be 50, little nuts holding that water jacket on, on each plate on each side. And there are so many nuts and bolts on this car. Uh, you know, we had to replace the pulley, on, not replace it, fix it. The pulley at the end of the crankshaft had uh, worked its way loose. The nut that holds on has worked its way loose. And what happened was the pulley would rock back and forward and there's a keyway that locks it in and it just chewed it up. But in any normal car, you would take the radiator off and the pulley would be on the other side. On the Bentley, the pulley is on the inside. That's why you have here a fan belt that you have to link together. You can't put a fan belt on this car unless you pull the engine out because the pulley is on this side of the cross member and the cross member does not come out. But once the work is done, it's just a fascinating car to drive, just a wonderful driving car. And the sad thing is, uh, I rescued this one. Uh, so many of these in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, were, uh, they'd be found in a barn or wherever, and then they'd be cut up and made into sort of, quote, hot rods or Le Mans tours. You know, they put an open body on it and they take this body and just throw it away. And so consequently, there aren't many of these left. You see, more Bentley team cars <laughs> than ever existed because people buy a Bentley and they realize, oh, they want that sort of dashing look of the 30s with the, the green fabric body and you know that type of thing. Uh, so a lot of these paid the price. Uh, this car came out of Chile. I believe it was the ambassador's car. It had been used as a chicken coop because it's big. You get a lot of chickens in this thing, you know? And uh, that's what it was. So it was totally restored. The wheelbase is 156 inches. The biggest Duesenberg was 153 and a half inches. And the biggest car in the world, the Bugatti Royale, was 169.3 inches. So that's the only one with a wheelbase bigger than this thing. And at the time this car was built, it was the biggest automotive engine ever produced in England, and also one of the fastest cars. I mean, the idea behind this car was you would take this, cross the channel, and drive across Europe at 75, 80 miles an hour. And you can do it easy. I mean, I take this on the 405 freeway, and it's a wonderful car, more than keeps up in traffic. 75, 80, rock steady, it's amazing. It has mechanical brakes, but it has a, a servo vacuum mechanical brake, so you can't tell that they're not hydraulic brakes. They, they work amazingly well. This car is pretty much all original, and I mean, obviously it's been restored and repainted, but the original radiator, original matching engine, transmission, whatever. A special four-speed transmission was developed especially for these cars. You know, it's funny, the, this and the Duesenberg are two of my favorites because they were the most advanced cars of the period and the only ones you could really drive the way you drive a modern car today. I mean, the Duesenberg, you go up and go 75, you accelerate onto the freeway, you're not holding people up. The Duesenberg had 
twin cams, four valve per cylinder. This is single cam, four valve per cylinder. But this has a four speed transmission. The Duesenberg had a three speed transmission. It just shows you different ways that people thought. Americans did not like to shift. The less shifting you had to do, the more prestigious or more powerful the car was. You know, This was noted because even in fourth gear, you could slow down to 10 miles an hour press the accelerator and still pull away cleanly without, uh, you know, bucking and, and, and that type of thing, just because of the tremendous torque of this motor. As I say, the setup is completely stock. We haven't modified it in any way. What size are these wheels? I'm not even sure. I've got to check and see. <laughs> They're pretty big. Let's show you the, well, let's start at the back of the car. This is kind of the, the cool part here. As you see, it's a very easy car to get into. And oh my God, it is so comfortable. There's so much room in this thing. But see, you've got a little table here and you've got storage compartments down there. Just to ride back here, it's like driving your library somewhere. You know, it's just the beautiful wood. I mean, it's just classic English design. All the elements are here. You know, the finest leathers, most beautiful wood. You've got lights everywhere. I got these little ashtrays here because everybody smoked back then. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes I just come here in the garage with nobody around. Ah, just take a little nap, just crash out here. It's, you know, you've got down filled leather cushions here. I mean, it, it's amazing how comfortable this car is to ride in and to drive. Don't forget, back in the 30s, most British people, if they did have a car, and it was fairly rare, with 750 cc's, most people had motorcycles with sidecars, the working man type person. And people would travel at 35 miles an hour. That's about right, maybe 40. To go 70 or 80 miles an hour was just unheard of. Uh, the steering is, well, you'll see how it is on the road. Of course, it's heavy, it rests, but once you're moving, it's quite nice actually, it's really terrific. This car was built to compete with the Rolls-Royce Phantom. And that was an excellent car, but it did not have the sporting pretensions of this thing. I mean, this was fast, it handled. Uh, this is the car that scared Rolls-Royce to death. That's why Rolls-Royce bought the company when it was in bankruptcy, because they just thought this would steal all their thunder. I think that's more than fair to say. Uh, Rolls-Royces are very nice, but they were not 100 mile an hour cars. Certainly not in 1930. See, the thing that killed this car, this chassis cost, in 1930, cost the equivalent of $293,000 in car, without the body on it. So you, <laughs> you had to be pretty wealthy. And don't forget, the Depression had just started in 1929. And of course, it was just as bad in Europe, if not worse than it was here. They barely got 100 of these out the door before Bentley went bankrupt. This is the car that was supposed to save the company. There just weren't enough rich people around that could afford it. I mean, the depression had hit, you know, showing this kind of wealth was seen as you know, kind of vulgar, especially in England. So consequently, only 100 cars were built. Bank uh, Bentley went into bankruptcy. They had like a kind of a, I don't know if it was the secret sale, but it turned out the high bidder was Rolls Royce and they essentially just crush the company. They didn't crush it. They took away anything that would compete with Rolls Royce. It became a second tier kind of deal. It's kind of way we had Cadillac and Oldsmobile. It was like Rolls Royce and then Bentley, you know. Um, and, and yeah, and that, uh, that was a devastating blow to WO. Uh, WO worked for Rolls Royce for I think a year, and then he went to work for Lagonda where he designed the V12 engine, his first modern engine, V12 overhead cam. Uh, that's another car I got over there. We'll talk about that one later. But let's get back to this thing. Let's show you the front seat now. Now here you got, of course, you've got your handbrake and your gear shift lever right there. Four speed transmission that I said. A whole complement of gauges and I'll show you how that works when we get inside and start it up. Uh, the sunroof is really cool. You're not really supposed to get in from this side. You're well, let me go around and show you how they get. This is how the chauffeur would get in the car. It's just easier to get on this side and slide over rather than have the gear shift go up your trouser leg, as they say. 
See how it's cut away here for the for the transmission? And got a flexible steering wheel. Have all your controls here. This is your choke starting and running, and this is uh, advance and retard, and this is a hand throttle as well. Uh, here's the sunroof. This just slides open that way. You can sort of pretend you're Winston Churchill and stand up and wave out the window if you like. And it has this cute little, that's your cigarette lighter, see that there? Sort of put that in there. Kind of a cool thing. That's your handbrake. And you have a control here for shock absorbers. Uh, you tighten this up or loosen it up and it, it uh, stiffens the shocks or loosens the shocks. This little thing here is, we put these wireless tail lights on this so you can see this thing from behind. For some reason, the English have these little tiny tail lights. You know, people didn't really drive at night. When these cars were built, the headlights were not so much to light up the road, but to keep pedestrians from seeing you. Uh, so you didn't run over them, you know. Uh, you couldn't really light up the road, but you could see a car coming and get out of the road in time. Most people sort of put their cars away at 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. Uh, most gas stations were not open at night. Uh, it wasn't so much later in the big cities they did that. I love the key, just the oddest sort of... Boy, it wouldn't be hard to uh, make one of those, would it? Yeah. Come on, I'll show you around the rest of the car. I'm gonna get out on the other side. My favorite is the trunk key. Let me show you that. Just looks like something you'd have in a child's music box or something. And put that in there. Turn it. And not a huge trunk, of course, but, and just some of the various tools you need for here. I, I guess I can take some of these out. This, this we made, obviously, to tighten the, the nut on the hubcap there. And then you've got various center hubcap, and you always want to hit it with a lead hammer so you don't damage the chrome. And just some various adjustment tools as well. All right, let's shut that again. There you go. Nobody's going to break into this baby unless they have a coat hanger. There we go. There we are. Uh, this is that wireless tail light I'm talking about. These are great if you have an antique car because you just stick them on any car and uh, it gives you gives you instant tail lights. Um, come around this side. We'll show you the other side of the engine. Obviously the exhaust side of the motor. Um, here's your oil filler cap right here. You know, if you can crank this engine, <laughs> you're a better man than I am. Um, it's not really for that so much, I think, as for timing. Uh, carry spare plugs here. Um, people always say, how does the engine fire with the plugs up there? I go, it doesn't, they're spare plugs. Uh, this is your one-shot lubricator right here. It's on this side, you hit that pedal and it sends uh, chassis lube to all the, the points of the end, all the points of the chassis, obviously, to keep it lubricated. But as you see, it's this is it's not perfect in here because this is a car that gets driven a lot. I really enjoy driving this thing, and to polish all this aluminum is is crazy. Uh, it just takes forever. And this is your oil filler right here. Um, all I've done is just with a red magic marker, just made it red, just easier to spot. So it's got exactly the right amount. It's a <laughs> It's a massive oil change in this thing. I forget how many gallons it is. Uh, it, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, here it is right here, right there. Uh, let's shut this out here. Mulliner was the most, I think, the most prolific uh, 
bodybuilder for Bentley. I think they did the both number. No two eight liters are exactly alike. These, when you're spending that kind of money in 1930, the equivalent of, well, by the time you put the body on, half a million dollars, you got what you wanted. So everybody wanted something just a little bit different. Uh, again, his skeleton key here locks the door. Just kind of old fashioned kind of deal right there. It's kind of cool. Um, you've got the windshield that opens. Uh, this opens as well. Uh, obviously, there was no air conditioning in 1930, so as much air as you could get in, you had the sunroof, you had this, you had the windows, and of course had the windshield that opened as well. So air was pretty much flowing through this thing all the time. Just not massive hinges, but pretty good size. As you see, the door is open quite wide. There's the Mulliner script right there. And Jack Barkley, I think he was the uh, dealer. A very uh, prestigious dealer of fine motor cars in the 30s. He used to run ads in all the magazines. The fun part is when you get those magazines from the 50s, see these cars, 25 pounds, 8 liter Bentley, you know, just, to, you know, just virtually giving them away. But let's take it next door, put it up on the lift, and we'll show you what it's like on the uh, underside. Okay, we got the Bentley up on our uh, sterile Coney lifts. I'm shooting this on an iPhone because we can't have crew members in the shop because of the COVID restrictions. So let's get underneath here. There's the massive brake drums, mechanical brake drums, as I said before, with a vacuum booster. These springs help uh, take some of the vibration, the squeaking out, take the noise out, actually. It's funny how that works. Do the same thing in my Bugattis. Massive 25 gallon tank rear end. There's the original muffler i believe there's your battery box and we've got a modern optima battery in there now normally this would be a whole 12 volt you know those big truck batteries but the optimas work great and they don't leak fluid and so they don't corrode anything no gaskets under there massive leak springs i love these gators here these are leather and what happens is you just kind of fill them with grease and they keep the grease in the springs as you can see, there's a modern or a newer drive shaft. We had the drive shaft balanced. I don't think that's cheating. There's the transmission. Look at this. Look at the. It looks like a bridge under here. Look at this frame. Unbelievable. There's, oh, let's give Ocean Shy a drive line. They did a nice job making that for us. Give them a plug. All this bracing here. Uh, November 2020, that's the last time we changed it. That's the modern oil filtration system I talked about before. Uh, it just makes sense to do that. <laughs> Look at the size of the clutch and the flywheel. Look at this electron crankcase. Look at look how big it is. I forget how many quarts this, uh, this Bentley is. It's got to be 14, something like that. Massive brakes in the front as well. There's the generator, as I said before. This car is just massively overbuilt. You know, and Toro Bugatti to insult Bentley said he built the fastest trucks in Europe. Uh, <laughs> and they're pretty massive. And this frame is truck-like, but you know, they're bulletproof. It's one of the few cars you can drive as hard as you want and you won't break it. Bugatti's tend to be a little bit on the delicate side, or as Bentleys, you can just pound them along the roads and they're fantastic. And the Bentley Drivers Club is great because any part you need is available. You know, they're not sticklers for number, matching numbers and all that kind of stuff. They just like to have cars that are fast and in the spirit of W.O. Bentley run the way they're supposed to. Okay, that gives you an idea, as I said, single exhaust. Once again, the Gators. Let's, uh, let's take it for a ride, come on. This is what Bentley was all about. Big, powerful, fast, smooth cars. You don't match that shift exactly. Uh, there we go. All right, yeah, see, it's 
non single it, it takes a certain skill to master the Bentley box, and when it's cold, it's a little tricky. I can't imagine what this must have been like to drive in 1930. I mean, you think of most cars are like Model T's, you know, drafty and kind of bumpy. This, just dead smooth. my favorite winter car you know in the summertime these tend to run a little bit on the warm side so you don't want to get stuck in 100 degree traffic in one of these but a nice day like today this English kind of weather where it's about 60 degrees Fahrenheit perfect I think I showed you the cigarette lighter there you go I just can't believe how good these brakes are for mechanical brakes. Well, the Packard's the same way, mechanical with a vacuum, which almost seemed like the way to go in 1930 before people trusted hydraulics, you know? You had the steel rod to the brake, but the vacuum helped give you uh, a little more pressure. I mean, it, she wants to run. You can feel her pulling. This and the Duesenberg are the two most powerful cars in the late 20s and early 30s. Although technically it's a 30s car, I was in the 20s, but close enough. You got this flexible steering wheel here, which is kind of fun. I just like all the comprehensive gauges on the dashboard. You know, most older cars, you go, well, they can't really go anywhere with it because you don't want to go much over 50, so it's going to take you a long time to get there. With this, not a, not a problem. I mean, it loves to run. It's got all kinds of torque all through the rest. There was an old saying back in the day, with the Bentley you look at the car, with the Rolls Royce you look in the car, because you want to say, well, who bought that, you know? With the Bentley you want to look at the car. It sounds funny to talk about this car as a sporting car with a sporting nature, but it really is true. You know, the big Rolls is, a lot of the big Packard sedans with the beer, they were just kind of like box cars on wheels. Even that Duesenberg Town car I have, and Duesenberg's are quite sporting, actually. That one's a little bit different, because it's, it's such a big, heavy box back there. A lot of wood, and, you know, if you go around a corner, it's like, whoa, whoa, hey, 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 you feel like you're going to tip over. Whereas this thing just handles wonderfully. And I find it fascinating that I was alive and a grown person when Bentley was still alive, but I never got a chance to meet him. As I said, he died in 71. That's when I was 21 years old. I would love to have met him, but I think it's fascinating. He was born in the 1800s in an agricultural society. He worked on trains, he worked on planes, and ultimately with automobiles. You know, when Bentley first started, he didn't like automobiles. He was a train guy. And he actually said, uh, cars are awful. All they do is splash blood on people when you go behind. But uh, he quickly got over that. There's a number of biographies on W.O. Bentley, and they're all quite good, and it really does make for an interesting read. But all the gears, everything in this car is massive, massively overbuilt. I've never had a tooth break in the transmission of a Bentley box. One of the other cars I have, but not one of these. And normally in L.A., it's 100 degrees, and you got the windows down, the windows up. It's kind of cozy being this thing and get a little engine heat coming through with all the windows shut and the sunroof closed in this kind of little luxurious cocoon. As I said, only 100 of these cars were built. I believe 78 remain. I've got, uh, I've got three of the eight liters, one open car, and then a hot rod using a, a, a three-liter rental chassis. A three liter Bentley chassis with eight liter Bentley engine, twin turbos on it. Uh, this is the only one that's 100% stock and just fantastic. As I said, Bentley did not really believe 
in supercharging or turbocharging. He liked naturally aspirated engines and didn't have enough power to make it bigger. I mean, it's hard to think of this engine as sort of the Hemi of the 1930s, but it was. It was the biggest engine ever produced in England and the most powerful. Just the fact that this car is capable of going 100 miles an hour with, I can't imagine what the coefficient of drag is in this thing, but it's gotta be horrible. So just the power and torque to push it to pull the wind at 100 miles an hour with a totally flat windshield. It shows you it's got some, some power. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this little history lesson on one of my favorites and one of my heroes, W.O. Bentley. Just a great engineer and uh, one of those intuitive guys, you know? Guys who just look at something and go, no, oh, it's two millimeters off, you know? I can stand there for a half an hour and not see it, but these guys are just great and they were their forefathers that made all the automobiles we have now possible, especially exciting ones. And I'm glad to see Bentley is still going strong and building cars in the W.O. tradition. Anyway, I hope you like this little uh, ride we took. And uh, how often do you do a four-door sedan that's exciting? So, see you guys next week. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs>